Hi, Pastor Matt. Listen, thank you for downloading or streaming this sermon. Pray that it blesses your heart. Two quick things that I wanna lay before you uh, before we get started in the proclamation of God's word. Uh, the first is, man, I, I love that you're dialing in to hear uh, what the Lord's put on our heart here at TVC, but I ask that you would only consume these messages as supplemental and in no way replacing your commitment um, and you're listening to your local church pastor. Uh, th these are good gifts of God's grace for the people of God to grow in, and yet they are not to replace, ever meant to replace, our belonging to a covenant community of faith where we are. The, the second thing I wanna lay before you is, is that there are a lot of man hours that men and women here at the Village Church put behind not just the creation of this, but the creation of all kinds of resources that, that are meant to help you grow and develop as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so if this blesses you or the other resources that have been created have blessed you, would you consider giving back to the Village Church to support not just these things, but the creation of even more resources for you and really for anyone who wants to indulge in them. Now, um, I, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you listen now to the proclamation of God's word. My name's Nikki, and I serve as a deacon at the Flower Mound campus. I've been at the village for six years. Our pastors have been kind to encourage me that I have the gift of hospitality. And that has led to doing things like serving in Connection Central, welcoming people into service, giving the announcements, and leading events for women and for singles here at our church. As our pastors and elders take seriously the topic of complementarianism, I pray that the women of the village would feel empowered and emboldened to walk out in our giftings, not only by their support, but by the Holy Spirit. I don't think there's a certain script for how that needs to look, and that's the beauty of it. As women, we can serve the church and help others flourish in their gifts, if only we would step into ours. Well, good morning. How are you? Doing all right? All right. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. We're going to be in Genesis uh, chapter 1. We are uh, in the back half of our fall series, and this uh, back half has focused on uh, really the distinctives of the Village Church. And when we use the word distinctives, here's what we're talking about, that there are some things uh, that one must believe, doctrinally speaking, there are some things that one must believe in head and heart that would make one a Christian. Uh, and then there are these other things that Christians who believe this kind of close hand of theology will differ on while still being brothers and sisters. You tracking with me? Uh, and so we started doing that uh, three or four weeks ago when we started with uh, where the village church lands when it comes to baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so we believe in believers' baptism via immersion, which means you get baptized after you become a Christian. And then we believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Lord's Supper, which means we're not transubstantiationists. We don't believe that uh, like the bread literally turns into the body, but we really believe the presence of Jesus is in the presence of his people while we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And, and here's what, what we've said. All sorts of people disagree with us on that, that are brothers and sisters in Christ. Like Methodists disagree with us on baptism on that front, right? Uh, Anglicans, gosh, even our Presbyterian brothers would look at that and go, you're wrong. And I'm here going, no, you're wrong. And they're like, no, you're wrong. And when we get to heaven, we will accept their apology, all right? Uh, and so that was uncalled for, right? So, so that would be a space where, man, there's disagreement, but Jesus is Lord. He's the Savior of our sins. He is the only means of grace that makes us right before the Lord. We're just going to disagree on this, and that's okay. It's just okay. Right? They're not heretics. I don't need to villainize them. I, I just think they're wrong, and they think I'm wrong. And, and I love, I've got dear friends that would just strongly reject everything I just said. And that's fine, because I would strongly reject everything that they're saying about those subjects. Right? And then week two, we talk about the electing love of God and the confidence that should ensue in the heart of a believer when they get that God's love for us isn't built on our merit, but on his generosity alone. That is a stunning truth. And once again, all over the landscape of evangelicalism, although I'm really starting to hate that word. 
Such a junk drawer nonsense word. Now, in the middle, there are all sorts of people just go, no, no, that's not the way it works. This is the way it works. And it's fine. I think they're wrong. They think we're wrong and it's okay, but because I'm, I'm just responsible for shepherding you and not shepherding evangelicalism. So I'm trying to love us well and line us up with the word of God. And then last week, JT English, I thought, did a masterful job of teaching on the inerrancy and sufficiency of God's word. Our flag is in the ground. We believe the Bible. And we know what that means when we say that. We know that the outside world is going to look at us like weirdos, like we just know it. Right? You believe what? Huh? Uh, how backwoods bigoted are you that you would believe those things? Well, we just know that's coming and we'll endure under that as we are the people of God who submit to the word of God as the inerrant, sufficient word given to us by God for the formation of our hearts and the invitation into life, while all the while also acknowledging that the word of God doesn't just create tension outside of the church walls, but inside the church walls. So, so here would be um, like when the Bible says that it corrects and rebukes and does all that, who, who is that happening to? Well, it's happening to us so that even as Christians, the Bible is going to put its weight on us and it will reveal to us just how much we've been discipled by the world. Right? This is one of the things that the Bible does. It, it shows us, hey, you're actually not taking your cues from me. You're taking your cues from the world that you've been discipled by. Right? And so really, this is the distinctive that shapes all our other distinctives. Right? Which leads, we've got two left in this series. And then we're going to roll into Advent, which is kind of blowing my mind. Right, uh, and, and so we've got this week, which is complementarianism or where the village church lands in regards to our view of the role of women in the church and home. And then next week, we'll talk about the sign gifts of the Holy Spirit. So I know you'll be excited about that one. The sign gifts, the weird gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that next weekend. Uh, and then from there, we'll be rolling towards Advent. And so here, when you, when you teach on complementarianism, here's what you can expect. Um, uh, many of you are going to think that my last name should be Cleaver by the time we're done today. And others of you are like, I knew he'd finally go liberal. I just knew as soon as I saw him wearing blue jeans, I knew eventually that dude was going to be baptizing cats. And, and, and so here, you're like, I'm, I'm just confident enough to trust the word of God and land where it lands. But I want you to understand why we, it's a, just a confusing day. So, so really, when we think about where Christians tend to land on this subject, there, there are four major categories. And so I want to show you a chart. I didn't come up with this chart. I got it from Guy Mason, who's the Aussie guy that preached for us uh, a couple of months ago, dear friend. And he, he came up with this chart that kind of helps Christians kind of see what the different postures are in regards to this question of women and the Bible and how this plays itself out. I, I need to warn you out of the gate that this will, at the early parts of this message, be much more of a lecture as I'm just seeking for you to understand all the pieces and then we'll talk about where we land as a church and what that looks like. So here they are, uh, biblical Christianity, feminism, egalitarianism, complementarianism, and patriarchy. Now, uh, depending on your background, one or more of those words could be cuss words to you, <laughs> right? Depending on your background. But here's where I'm trying to just kind of inform you. Notice that half of patriarchy is cut out under the framework of biblical Christianity and notice that half of feminism is cut out around biblical Christianity. So on the patriarchy side of things, you can have misogyny and all sorts of wicked, evil things that have occurred in churches, outside of churches, around the overemphasis of male domination. And then on the far side of feminism, you have kind of the gender fluidity and that men don't matter and everything that men do are evil and, and there should be nothing masculine in the world that is not evil and oppressive and should be snuffed out. Right? So I'm saying those two things, let's lop those things off and let's just get in to here. And, and then just my cards on the table, even inside these brackets, I think patriarchy has some good, true things in it, but it's an overemphasis that creates a kind of um, underdevelopment in the church. And I think feminism is the same way, an overemphasis on the other side of things that leads to some underdevelopment where the church cannot flourish and the beauty of God's good design can't be seen and celebrated. All right, so that's my cards on the table. So let's dive in to these categories and, and we'll just see what the Lord has for us today, right? The, the first one would be Christian feminism. Let me quote Catherine Bushnell. 
Here's where the great mistake is made on the woman question. And here's the woman question. Is it prudent to allow women to do thus and so? Men ask themselves this at every step of a woman's progress. The only question that should be asked is, does justice demand this? If so, let justice be done, though the heavens fall, and anything short of justice is mere mischief-making. All right, I'm going to try to, as charitably as I can, define Christian feminism. A Christian feminist is someone who seeks to define and defend the equal rights of women in all spheres of life, whether that's politically, economically, socially, or spiritually. So that's Christian feminism. And I, all I want to say is that I like that it's charitable because I have left out the violence by which they perceive masculinity. I've just cut that out because they view with great skepticism, fear, and anger, many of them because of experiences and backgrounds the role of a man and anything open to a man that wouldn't be open to a woman is hostile that leads to oppression. Right now, they root this in the Bible. In fact, Christian feminists tend to like about three verses of the Bible and then reject the rest of it. And and this is me being charitable. Uh, And I know I'm going to get some emails and let's just play, right? I'm just really confident in, in what the word of God has said. It's not like I just studied this this week, right? There's a full paper on this in our website. And behind that is a 60 page exegetical paper that's just on the texts that are around this issue. This isn't laziness coming out. This is hard, long work from our elder board that's being rolled out here today, right? And, and so in this, they, they're going to make the argument theologically based on Genesis 1, 27 and 28. So let's look at that together. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, so here, here's the text. Right here, here you've got God creating man and woman in his image, male and female. He created them and he gives them dominion. So the argument that Christian feminists make is that there's no difference between the man and woman and any role distinction is about the oppression of women and the subjugation of women under the tyranny of men. That's the argument. Now, in this space, Christian feminists tend to, because they view the Bible with great skepticism, because they will argue, 85, 90% of them will argue that the Bible was written by men for men to protect the power of men. That this is the argument that Christian feminists want to make. And so they view the Bible with a great deal of skepticism, which is why you're going to find most Christian feminists tend to be uh, whoever wants to get married can get married and land on the side of the pro-choice movement, right? Women can have abortions whenever they want to have abortions and anybody who wants to get married can get married. Marriage is not given to the man and the woman in um, sacred union, but is given and available to all, right? And so they're going to land far left on social issues. Why? Because they question the Bible. Because they're concerned about the authority of Bible and what that means, right? And so that would be Christian feminism. Now, um, let's talk about patriarchy. Remember what I said about these two, right? Remember that, that I said parts of what they believe is just completely out of orthodoxy, but then there is some kind of, it's truth, but it's an overemphasized truth, right? So where Christian feminists would just say, hey, listen, we've both been created in the image of God. We've got dignity, value, and worth. I just hardly affirm that and say yes and amen to that, but it's an overemphasizing uh, of woman so that there is no distinction. And we believe there's a distinction. Right? A dependence, but also a distinction. And so we'll talk more about that when we get to where we land. Right? So now, let me read this quote. I'm, I'm going to be straight with you. I'm a little anxious about reading it, but I'm just going to read it. I, I want you to hear me. Look right at me. This is a quote. <laughs> we, we good? Okay. It's Martin Luther, one of the fathers of the Protestant Reformation. Men have broad and large chests and small, narrow hips and more understanding than women who have but small and narrow breasts and broad hips. To the end, they should remain at home, sit still, keep house, and bear and bring up children. Martin Luther, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) Martin Luther, not Matt Chandler. Martin Luther, one of the fathers of the Protestant Reformation. Now, you could say that terrible statements like that, and that is a terrible statement. 
Terrible statements like that uh, are what really led to organizations like Vision Forum uh, outline 26 principles making up the tenets of Christian patriarchy. Now, this includes a declaration that God is masculine. So patriarchs believe, hey, people land in this camp, God is masculine. Here's the deal. He is. Right? He is he. And Jesus was a man. Right? He wasn't gender fluid. He was a man. He, didn't, he wasn't Jesse. He didn't come as a woman. He is a man. Man, man, man. Jesus of Nazareth, the man. <laughs> Patriarch would uh, argue that the family is the foundation of society, and they're right. It is. Where the family goes, the culture goes, the country goes. This has been true throughout human history. It's true right now. In fact, I think you can track most of the issues we're having in our country back to a disintegration of the family unit. That's another sermon for another day, right? They're going to argue this is modeled in the patriarchs of the Old Testament, but is also upheld in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 11.3. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Jesus Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is is God. So this is said to mean that all women must be under the authority of a man at all times. So ladies, you would start under the authority of your father. And then once you got married, you would be under the authority of your husband. And then God forbid, if your husband were to die, you would be under the authority of your son, your brother, or some male pastor. That, that's how they would interpret this verse in light of the old Testament. In addition to male authority, Christian patriarchy teaches that men and women have different roles in the world. Now, complementarians believe this also, right? But we'll talk about that because they're, like I said, it's an overemphasis. Phil Lancaster said this, the God ordained and proper sphere of dominion for a wife is the household and that which is connected with the home. While unmarried women may have flexibility, it is not the fitting role of women to work alongside men as their functional equals in public spheres of dominion. Now, do you see they're both doing the same thing? Like what's happening in Christian feminism is an overemphasis on women at the neglect of men. Men are to be questioned. They're not to be trusted. They'll use their power to oppress and destroy. And then those on the patriarchy side, I've got my, no, I'm looking at this. You're looking at it. On the patriarchy side of things, you've got women can't be trusted. Women can't. Women just need to stay at home and take care of the babies. And I'm not in any way slandering stay-at-home moms. What a beautiful calling you've been given. But that's not the only calling you've been given. All right, now, with, with that said, let, let's move into, uh, well, let's talk about this. How, how does patriarchy view women in the church? Well, women are not permitted to be ordained. Voting rights are often deferred to the husband. Women can't lead Bible studies, and they're not allowed to lead worship or speak publicly during the Southern ga Sunday gathering. In other words, they're better seen than heard. They're better seen than heard, all right? Now, so, so that's gonna take us off the edges and into the middle here, all right? Egalitarianism. Now, egalitarians argue that a fully authoritative Bible, all right, supports the freedom of women under Christ without male supervision to follow their God-given callings and special gifts of the Spirit, including the leadership ministries of elder and lead teacher. So if you're like, well, that sounds a little bit like Christian feminism. There are massive differences between Christian feminists and egalitarians. Here's the major one. Egalitarians want to argue from the Bible. Whereas Christian feminists would be skeptical of the Bible, in fact, would argue culturally and not biblically, they would argue from pain, not from truth. Egalitarians want to take us to the book. And here's what's great about anyone wanting to take us to the book. We're people of the book. Let's get to the book. Right? We're, we're people of the book. Yes and amen. Let's get into that word. But that's not the only different. They, they also are not suspicious of male leadership as long as there are no rooms that are off limits to women. So they would rejoice in male eldership as long as there could be female eldership. They would rejoice in male Sunday morning preaching as long as there could be female Sunday morning preaching, right? They, they would argue from the Bible and they would not be suspicious of men in leadership as long as they are held in check by women, right? And then most egalitarians reject the pro-choice movement and uphold the biblical definition of marriage as being between one man and one woman. Here's their theological case, right? Um, the, they're going to argue that the point of Genesis 1 and 2 is oneness. 
right? They're going to read those same verses. In fact, uh, across the spectrum, everybody's living in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, right? So they're going to look at Genesis 1 and 2, those same verses we just read, and God made them in his image, male and female, he created them, and gave them dominion. And they're going to say, no, 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 the whole point uh, of the creative order is that the man and woman were created as one. And then they're going to fly through to Galatians 3 in uh, the New Testament. And they're going to point out uh, the teaching of Paul to the church at Galatia, where he says, there's no longer male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. They're going to argue that what we see in Genesis 3.16, let's go check that out together. This concept of male headship or the authority of man that that is a result of sin entering the world and was in no part of God's original design for humankind. So let's look at this. This is the pronouncement of judgment on the man and woman for rebellion against him. Uh, Genesis 3, starting in verse 16. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Right? Do do you hear what's happening in the back part of that text? So egalitarians are going to go, okay, listen, there was no male headship until sin entered the world. And when sin entered the world, then you've got male headship. So when Jesus Christ came and got victory over sin and death, the need for male headship is gone. So there is no distinction in role between the man and the woman. Maybe there is biologically, but they are certainly not in regards to their roles. They are the same. They argue oneness. They argue headship is a part of the fall. And they rightly argue with biblical testimony. So in the Old Testament, Esther was instrumental in protecting God's people. Deborah served as a judge, the highest office of that day, sans prophet and priest. And so oftentimes, like uh, I think those uh, on more of a kind of patriarchal kind of view of things will go, yeah, but Deborah's in a leader in a season in which, man, it was the worst time in Israel's history. So surely we're not going to look at that as normative. Listen, I, I think that argument backfires. Like if God's going, this is a train wreck, let me put a woman uh, uh, up uh, at top. That, that's saying something else, right? I mean, it's just so dumb that so blinded, they're going to make an argument that actually erodes their position, not strengthens it. It's not an argument that needs to be made. Deborah was a judge. She was actually pretty good at it. You've got prophets such as Miriam and Hulda. And then in the New Testament, we see women active in the life of the church. In 1 Corinthians 11, women serve in prayer and prophesying in the public gathering. In Philippians 4, we have women evangelists. Acts 12, women leading house churches. In Romans 16, we read of Priscilla, who was singled out by Paul as his fellow workers in Christ Jesus. In Romans 16, 7, you have Junia, who, according to egalitarians, was a woman Apostle. There is some debate around that, uh, but egalitarians are going to, this is a female apostle, right? So all of that, they argue from the Bible. They they argue from the Bible. In fact, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes by N.T. Wright. And N.T. Wright's going to draw this up. He, He says, the first person to take the message of Jesus to others is Mary Magdalene. Now, that is so counterintuitive in the ancient world. Here is the first person to tell someone else that Jesus is alive. And it's a woman. And not just any woman, it's Mary Magdalene. This is God choosing what is weak to shame the strong. And it seems to me that in the resurrection, there is a radical revaluation for the role of women. Now, egalitarians also are not afraid of difficult texts. So the texts that seem to run contrary to what they're trying to teach, those texts that are clearly prohibitive and and clearly teach male headship and clearly teach, they, they, they can have a conversation with you about those. So let me give you two examples for time's sake. If you take like 1 Corinthians 11, which we uh, read earlier, which speaks of husbands being the head of their wives and an egalitarian is going to make a technical argument. They're going to say, well, that word head there doesn't mean that he's over her, but rather that she was taken out from him. So if you remember in the creation narrative, you've got Adam uh, was, was created by God and then there was a rib pulled from him, fashioned into a woman so that Eve came out of Adam. So they're going to say, hey, head here doesn't mean any type of authority or, or covering, but rather that she was taken out of him. 
really their favorite argument around any prohibitive text or any text that creates structure around a female's role in the home or the church is to um, blame it on cultural norms in the first century and blame it on issues that are back there that have no bearing on today. So let me give you um, the, the most common example I've come across around this. So when we look in uh, the book of Ephesians and, and we see that, that Paul is asking the wife to submit to her husband, the argument is that there's something going on in Ephesus culturally, namely the temple of Artemis and Artemis worship and those kind of things that have affected the way they see and understand the world. And so what Paul is teaching, it belongs to them and doesn't bear weight on us. They're going to do that with the Timothy passage because that's also, uh, Timothy's also in Ephesus. They're going to say these texts, aren't Paul saying what he's saying? He's saying something different. He's addressing a cultural norm and not something bound up in creation or God's design, right? And this is how egalitarians will argue from difficult texts. Now, let, let me stop there. Um, I have dear godly friends that land here. I read their books. I listen to their sermons. They're godly, ferocious men and women. And I think they're wrong. And we're great friends, and we'll sit across a cup of coffee, and we'll have conversations around this, coffee or some other beverage given to the people by God through the grace of Jesus Christ, and we will just have a, a conversation about, okay, well, what do you do with this then, and how do you make sense of this, and then how does this work itself out? And so then tell me then uh, how you tease this text apart, or what do you do with this, or, or help me understand this. I want to understand this, brother. I want to understand this, sister. In fact, uh, Lauren and I will be flying with some friends up to New York in uh, a few weeks, and, and because I'm a good complementarian, I asked Lauren if it'd be okay uh, for me to connect with a buddy of mine up there. And as soon as she gave me permission, I called him uh, and said, hey, would you like to get together? And he, he, man, I love him. Just such a gifted, powerful preacher, such a smart, smart man. And he lands here and he's wrong. And so we, we can see much good and much beauty in what the egalitarian is trying to do, but we feel like it falls short of the full scope and scale of the word of God which is why we're complementarians. So let me show you this, because we've got to talk about complementarianism, because we've got our own issues, right? So let me put up a new slide. So here's complementarianism, and, and what we're saying in complementarianism is, is we are um, distinct from one another, but dependent upon one another, right? Distinct and dependent. What we're trying to do uh, is we're, we're trying to move to this place where neither is overemphasized and both mutually respect and understand. Right? And so here's how complementarism will play out in its practicalities, not its belief. So you're going to find a lot of people that say we're, we're complementarians, but act far more uh, like those in the patriarchy camp, or they're going to say they're complementarians, but actually work far more like egalitarians. Right? And so here's, here's kind of what we came up with. Um, there are careful complementarianisms, right? They're, they're nervous about this issue. And so they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I know, I know that's just a gray area. So let's just err on being conservative. Right? Yeah, I can kind of see that in the text. I kind of see your point. But man, if we do that, this slippery slope, I mean, it won't be long. We'll be baptizing cats. And, and then what are we going to do once the church becomes that? Right? They're just nervous. We don't want to be careful complementarians. We want to be convinced. We want to be convinced. We want to operate in the spaces that God has created as we celebrate being distinct and dependent from one another. Right? We just want to celebrate this and rejoice in this. This is God's good gift to us. And so let's talk about uh, where the Village Church lands, and then we'll talk about what you can expect. This is Sam Storms, just a, a friend of mine and, and just one of the smarter men I've ever been around. Men and women are together created in the divine image and are therefore equal before God as persons possessing the same moral dignity and value and have equal access to God through faith in Christ. Men and women are together the recipients of spiritual gifts designed to empower them for ministry in the local church and beyond. Therefore, women are to be encouraged, equipped, empowered to utilize their gifting in ministry, in service to the body of Christ, and through teaching in ways that are consistent with the word of God. This principle of male headship should not be confused with nor give any hint of domineering control. Rather, it is to be loving, tender, and nurturing care of a godly man who is himself under the kind of gentle authority of Jesus Christ. The elders and pastors of each local church have been granted authority under the headship of Jesus Christ 
to provide oversight and to teach, preach the word of God in corporate assembly for the building up of the body. The office of elder and pastor is restricted to men. Now, let me make the theological case here, okay? Um, we would agree with the egalitarians quickly that God has created us in his image, male and female he creates. We would agree with the egalitarians because they agree with the Bible that we have been given dominion over the creative order. And then very quickly, we start to disagree on some things. And I want to walk you through that. Now, first of all, let me, let me establish this because I think it's so helpful for us to see this in light of what it is. At creation, you have the man made in the image of God. You've got this kind of idyllic, like old school Marlboro commercial, All right? The world is wild. The man is there. He may or may not be on the back of a horse with a Winchester rifle looking out at rugged plains, maybe a dip in, probably not. Sin had it into the world. I want to get his face all eaten up with cancer. He's looking out at it. And so God looks at this most masculine of men and says, yeah, this ain't good. He says, it's not good for the man to be alone. And then he says, and this, this so causes bristling, and I'll never understand why it causes bristling. And some of you are like, because you're a man. But no, let me explain. He, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then what did God do for the man? It's not that he didn't give him a golden retriever, won a labradoodle. It, it wasn't, it, it wasn't some kind of new machine that was going to help him fulfill the plans God has for him. It was a woman, a helpmate. And don't bristle under that word, because if you start to think about it, that is the same Hebrew word used for God helping his people. All right, and so here, here, I want to try to shift maybe how you're thinking about being a helpmate to a man. The deficiency in that moment is not the woman, but the man. Brothers, this should humble us. That's not like God is looking like, oh, this guy's got it. He's like, oh, God, no, 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 this isn't going to work. I know I'm going to help him so that our wives, our sisters, at the ladies given to us in life are there so that we might fulfill the call of God on our lives. And without them, God's going, this isn't good. So don't bristle under helmet. This isn't about getting a sandwich. This is about helping God. And I'm saying that for you men to hear and for you women to be encouraged. God hasn't given me a maid. He's given me a helpmate. Right, someone who's going to help me fulfill God's call on my life. For God's big plan for Matt Chandler's life, he knew I needed Lauren Chandler. And I needed her gifts, her abilities, her grace, her zeal, her passion for Jesus to come up and bolster me up, encourage me, speak truth to me, and chisel off my rough edges. And if you're a guest and you're like, well, she has done a poor job, you should have heard me 10 years ago. <laughs> hey, you don't know what you're talking about, all right? This is much more nuanced Matt Chandler. So, so we're going to look and say, and let me give you this quote. I, again, I, I love this stuff, and, and maybe I shouldn't because I know, I know what my inbox will look like this week, but, but here's Peter Kreeft. I love this. Women really are superior to men at being women. I love that line. And, and men really are superior to women at being men. And here's why we think complementarianism is the space in which we all flourish. The point in complementarianism is that men and women are distinct from one another, but dependent upon one another. You with me? Distinct, but dependent. If you ever want to kind of just succinctly explain where the church lands, we are distinct, but dependent. We are different, but in need of one another. You with me? Gosh, that's such good news. So, so we've got this helper now uh, that, that's been given to us. But then also, here, here's where we're getting. We're, we're separating from the egalitarians and what they believe. Although we respect that they love the word of God and we trust that they, they, they are serious about the Bible and serious about making Jesus known and famous. And, to, and they convictionally believe that this is true. We're going to immediately start to argue uh, yet again that, that even before sin was entered into the cosmos, that male headship existed. He, let, me, let me give you the reasons why we're going to land there as complementarians. Um, in, in the story of sin entering the cosmos, here's, I've got to tighten this sermon up, otherwise we're going to be here until the Cowboys kick off. We can't have that. And, and so uh, you, you've got Eve in the garden walking around with Adam, and the serpent begins to whisper to her, begins to lie to her. Adam says, I don't know what he's doing. You know, he did more. He's just passive moron. He's just kind of, oh. And, and Eve's being lied to. And then Eve buys the lie. She believes the lie and, and she rebels against 
God and then hands it to her husband who joins in the rebellion. And when God shows up in the garden, who does he ask for? Adam. And here's his question. Adam, what is this thing that you have done? Not Eve. Are you serious? It's Adam. What have you done? So there is accountability on Adam for the spiritual climate of his home before sin is on the radar. God holds Adam accountable. Brothers, look at me. God has put the weight of the spiritual climate of your home on you. The flourishing of your wife, the flourishing of your children in God's good design is about you being the kind of man that God has called you to be. And this is why it's a scary thing to be a husband and father because the collateral damage of our rebellion is our wives and children. And you shouldn't take that weight lightly. You should never take that weight lightly. Honestly, for me, it can be crushing if I'm not careful. So you see this accountability. And then even when we go to the judgment in Genesis 3, and again, we're, we're going to differ from Egos because we think that, it, that even in the pronouncement of the judgment, we're going to see where they're going to say what you see in Genesis 3, 16 is God reordering his design because of sin. So now you've got male headship because sin has entered the world. We're going to say, no, no, no. It looks like male headship is there. And not only that, we don't believe you see a reorder ordering of creation in the relational roles in Genesis 3, 16, really the whole pronouncement, but the difficulty injected into the creative order as God designed it. So in Genesis 3, here's what you begin to see. God says to the man, the ground will be hard for you. Brothers, quick question. Have you ever set your face to do the things that please the Lord and would serve the Lord and would be to be the kind of man that God has called you to and found that to be difficult? Anybody? Just say, hey, man, I found that to really be. It's like the whole universe is conspiring against me. Okay, look at me. It is. It's sin and death, and it is. And then for the, the woman, he, he says, there's going to be difficulty between you and your children, namely at their birth. Now, if you've got to learn breathing techniques and soak in water and or have someone stick a needle into your spinal cord to block feeling from your pelvis down, I'm guessing the kind of pain involved here is something that by the grace of God, I don't get to participate in. <laughs> right? And, and so then you see, then you see also um, that there's going to be this misfire between the man and the woman. Right? And that's what we read earlier about this kind of um, that your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. He's just saying that in that moment, because of sin, we're going to miss each other. Gosh, we've experienced all of this. Married couples, you don't have to agree with me because I know it's true. Have you ever been trying to explain yourself to your spouse and, and you just think, hey, this is as clear as I can possibly be? And, and they think you're saying something completely other and actually offended by what you're saying. So then they come back and you're like, I didn't even say that. And then, you, and then it just keeps elevating, right? This is Genesis 3. Just, and again, I don't, you don't need to nod at me. Don't look at your, don't look at me. You will prove that I am right if you look over at your spouse right now. All right, if you're like, you'll just go, pastor was right today. All right, now uh, I, I want to show you that Genesis 3 doesn't reorder. So, so look at this. Uh, if you look back at Genesis 3, 16, the, the second half of that, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now, to make sense of that text, I, I think we have to go to Genesis chapter 4. So in Genesis chapter 4, you find the exact two same Hebrew words there for desire and rule. In that, God is telling Cain that sin is out to destroy him and he must rule over it. And so here's uh, the text in Genesis 4. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So in other words, desire and rule are set as two competing forces. Sin desires to control Cain. And he is being instructed by God to rule and have control over that sin. So, so how does that help us interpret Genesis 3.16? You're asking all the right questions at the right time. It explains that when sin has the upper hand in Eve's life, when she's far from the Lord, when she's not in step with the Spirit, when she's not submitting her life to the Lord, it becomes easy 
to not lovingly trust her husband, but desire to control and usurp his authority. In the same way, when sin has the upper hand in Adam's life, when a husband is far from the Lord, when he's not in step with the Spirit, it becomes easier for him to not lovingly lead his wife, but seek to overpower and dominate her. Now again, here's where egalitarians and complementarians are going to separate. We believe that what Christ has accomplished is not got rid of male headship, but interjected into Christian marriage a reaffirming of the beauty of God's design. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 5 when he tells Christian husbands to love their wives like Christ loved the church and tells wives to respect and submit to their husbands like the church does Christ. What's happening is that God is reminding us of the beauty of the picture of God's good design for his sons and his daughters. So that rather than Christ coming and saying, Chandler, you have no authority in your home. There's oneness and nobody takes the lead, right? Except what you mutually agree on. He's saying, no, 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 Chandler, you die to yourself. You lead and love your family and you create and cultivate an environment where your wife excels in her giftings and your children excel in what they've been called to. And you die to yourself to help that happen. And Lauren, as he does this, you love him, encourage him, and respect him. And by that, you will reveal to the word, my world my design and my good pleasure. This is what's happening in the home in complementarianism. That what I'm going to be held accountable to by God Almighty is the environment that I've cultivated in my home. Which, by the way, will, for all of us brothers, require sacrifice. Right, so it, I've got a little bit of time. So Lauren will sing next weekend. She's just a gifted songwriter. We sing several of her songs. She's just a gifted writer, teacher. So next week, well, I'll have to shift my whole week this week, right? Because what happens is she's going to need to get up here at one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon and, and, and do the deal with the band so they can be ready to play at the, the five o'clock, which means that my normal routine is gone. Uh, I'll have to be super ready uh, to preach the thing because I'm going to have to get here late because I got three children. And so I'm going to watch the kids. She's going to come uh, up here and and I'm going to have to just completely rework how my week normally works. It's not my preference that my week works that way. It's that my wife has a distinct gift that she's giving to the church as she surrenders to Jesus Christ. And God's call on my life is to get over my ideal week and help it happen. This is the call of God on my life. It's not to go, well, you know, one of us has really been called by, it's, it's just evident that God has gifted me in a unique way, and so I love that you do these things, but here's the thing. Like, you're singing background vocals, and what I'm doing is, right? I mean, how's that going to go? In fact, we will not podcast this service just for fear that she might listen to that. That's not my play. My play is what? Okay, let me reorder the week. Let me start to figure out how we can make this happen. Um, She is headed to Berlin with my oldest daughter in December to to do some work among refugees in Germany. So what's my role? Not to go, well, it's dangerous over there. Well, I appreciate that God's called you to such things, but uh, I can't be watching babies. No, my my role is, okay, let's figure this out. Let's bless you. Let's pay for those tickets and, and let me figure out, let me build the plan. All right? and, and, and she would joke that that's, that's what I'll do. I'll literally have a little schedule and we'll walk through it with the kids and we'll just get into the schedule, right? Because if not, I can't handle that chaos, man. I'll freak out. Uh, and so th- this, is, this is what it looks like at home. Now, let's talk about then what this looks like in church. Uh, I love Tim Keller on this. And, and Tim, if you don't know who Tim Keller is, just think Yoda. Here's what he says. On the one hand, women are clearly partners with men in ministry. Women were ministry leaders. They were active in evangelism, discipleship, education, mercy ministry, leading in the house churches, as well as praying and prophesying in public worship. It appears from this that there are no ministry gifts nor ministries that are forbidden to women. And yet Paul draws some limits. Gosh, Tim. So what are those limits? Let's chat. I've got to speed up. Um, egalitarians are right to look to the Old Testament and highlight the ferocious women of God in the Old Testament and how they were used. 
But one of the things I've never really heard anybody unpack is the fact that in all of that, judges and queens and, and prophetesses and, and all of that, there's never a woman priest. Never a woman in the Levitical order. So this is a space that according to God's design, there, there were no women that operated in it. And then as we see Jesus select his disciples, he selects 12 men. Now, maybe it's because Jesus was nervous about upsetting the social norms. Probably not. Probably, I mean, I'm just going to guess. Probably not. Or, or maybe it was because Jesus thought women were inferior. Well, that's certainly not the case. They're all over his ministry. In fact, who is the one that discovered he had resurrected? Who did he appear to first upon his resurrection? Right? So what's going on? Could it be that in Jesus' selection of the 12 disciples and in there being no female priests, they were hearkening back to the creative order for the flourishing of women and men in God's creative design? I think so. We think so. We're going to operate like this is true. Right Now, with that said, then on top of that, you have all these other texts that are just clearly prohibitive in regards to how we're to function in our distinct yet dependent states. 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. I'll just stop there. So, so let, me, let, let me kind of unpack this for you because I think this is one of those texts that everybody kind of bristles at. But I want to point out the very first command in the text. Let a woman what? Learn. Right? And if you, if you knew what um, temple was like, tabernacle was like, women weren't allowed in those inner circles. They weren't allowed to learn uh, about doctrine and the word of God. And what's Paul's command? No, no, you let them learn. You let him learn, and then what's his argument around that office of elder and lead teacher being to men? Is it a cultural argument like the egalitarians make? It's not. He's pointing back to creation. He didn't say, um, you know, learn in all submissiveness. And I know over at the Temple of Artemis, they don't do it that way, but here at our, this is the way we're going to do it as Christians. He does that in other places. Heck, Jesus even engages at different times these cultural moments. That's not what Paul ties this to. He ties it to creation. There is a design at hand for the flourishing of men and the flourishing of women and, and the foundational home being this central place of discipleship. So in the church, women learn. Men, because of God's design, you are elders who are meant to die to yourself to lead the people of God. This is why one of the caveats, one of the commands for an elder is that he love his household well. Because a man who's not willing to sacrifice and die for his wife and children will rarely, if ever, do it for a body that he doesn't know. So this is why when we're interviewing elder candidates, we spend a lot of time with the wife. If that wife has concerns uh, or, or objections, that's a deal killer meeting one. He had better love, serve. She had better look like a well-watered vine bearing fruit. That's what the Bible says happens when a man loves his wife like Christ loved the church. Now, what can you expect here? Well, let me read this. this is, if I could just summarize it. Here's complementarianism. Women and men are equal in dignity, value, and worth. Women have been gifted by God and called by him to play a significant role in the ministry of the church. By the way, if I'm too fast, we got a massive paper on our resource page where you can read about all of this. Behind that is a 60-page exegetical paper. Uh, and, and so feel free to kind of dive into this. I know I've had to move quickly. Now, what can you expect at the Village Church? Okay, let, let me walk through this quickly. Um, when it comes to how we'll see women at the village church, how we see women, we're looking at siblings, not subordinates. Do you hear me? The, the most consistent way we are described as men and women in the Bible in relationship to one another is not husband and wife, but brother and sister. So we are to love one another with a brotherly, sisterly uh, affection. So we will be seeing one another as siblings, not subordinates. And so ladies, you will not be seen as subordinates nor playing a junior varsity role here at the village. You can expect to see women participate across the scope of the village church. You will see in our weekend gatherings, women reading scripture, women praying, women singing. You will see across our leadership structure, women with voice and vote. And We've got women on our executive staff. We have women ministers around here, and you will not see women step into spaces that the Bible prohibits. 
Jen Wilkin is one of the more gifted Bible teachers I've ever been around in my life. I mean, that woman can teach the word of God. And we want to champion that and create space for that and celebrate that. And she'll never preach on the stage on a weekend gathering. She's never going to be an elder. She's on an exec team. She, she has the largest women's Bible study in the universe, I think is what I read. And, uh, and, and yet she, the, the Bible would say, and she, she was in the last service giving me an amen in this, right? That this is a spot. She does not want my job, right? She's not gonna do it. But you're gonna see women all over our organization leading and loving in the ways that God has asked them to lead in love. So, so let me encourage a couple of things. Single women, let me chat with you for a second. Um, if you're a single woman in here, here's my encouragement to you. I want you to feel freed up to grow in a knowledge of the word of God, grow in doctrine, grow in leadership without having to wait for a man. In fact, I, I would just encourage you that a sure way to spray on boy repellent, are you tracking with me? Like if you don't want some immature fool to kind of pursue you, flirt with you, mess around with you, it's just become ferociously godly and brilliant around theology and doctrine and the word of God. Like boys are, are turned off by that. Men see it and go, praise that I'm going to ask him for that, Lord. And he'll speak in a tongue, right? Hey, that, that's, uh, that's next week's sermon. So uh, anyway, they, they'll see that and they'll be like, yes, Lord, he has heard my prayers. They will join Adam and say, whoa, I mean woman. Thank you. All right. So listen, don't wait. Lead. The spirit of God is inside of you. You've been given gifts. Lead. Single brothers. As you grow in your own understanding and knowledge of the word of God, of doctrine and of truth. Look at me, encourage your sisters. Speak life into them, celebrate their giftedness. Create space for them to lead and step into spaces that God's designed them to lead and step into. Put to death your insecurities. Married men, You have been given a command by God to create an environment in which your wife's gifts and abilities are unleashed on the world and on the church with your blessing, support, and celebration. And if you in your own brokenness because of your own father wounds or because of your own way are, are anxious about what that means and you have knowingly or even unknowingly suppressed and belittled and subjugated and, and made them feel as though they have no gifts and no, I, that you are doing is an abuse of your headship on the daughter of the king sovereign of the universe. And you are a fool if you don't think Hebrews 12 kind of judgment isn't coming for you. You will not berate and belittle the daughters of the king without being, according to Hebrews 12, scourged as sons. And I'm just speaking to you like you were a Christian. If you're not a Christian, it'll be worse than scourging from God. Because I know when we start to talk about this, there's a type of man, which I'm, I'm being way too liberal with that term. There's a type of male who would use the kinds of verses we see in the scriptures to keep his spouse afraid and disoriented, feeling like she's the crazy one while she's being uh, uh, mentally and spiritually abused. Ladies, you need to hear me say this. We are far more concerned about your safety and you getting to a space where you feel safe and, and secure than we are about your husband's misapplication of text that he doesn't understand. You are not a slave and you are not a servant. It's not what you are. You're daughter of the king, filled with the Holy Spirit, given gifts by God. This is what complementarianism is. This is how we want to live. You're going to see us celebrate our sisters. And it should be a really beautiful picture to the world around us of the goodness and grace of God and his design, especially in such confusing, weird times. So there we are. Some of you think I'm, my last name's Cleaver, and you can't believe you ever came here. And others of you knew it was only a matter of time until I went full-on liberal. 
And, and yet what I'm going to argue is I'm just really, really convinced that this is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these men and women. Thank you that you've made us distinct from one another. We're not the same. We're not the same biologically. We're not the same in regards to makeup. We're not the same even in regards to calling. And yet we are dependent upon one another. So I thank you that we need one another. Let's pray we not blow past that. Pray all the more that we might celebrate our sisters and they might celebrate us as brothers and we might be seen uh, as a place where uh, men and women flourish together as they have mutual respect and uh, as they encourage one another in their giftings. And uh, I do pray for our husbands in here. I pray for our wives in here. I pray uh, for our single men, our single women. Bless us in this area. What an opportunity we have to be a picture for the world of your goodness and grace. Pray for my brothers in here who are broken men tend to be angry, unsettled, insecure. Pray they might feel the weight of all of that and finally, maybe finally seek some help. Pray for my sisters who feel overwhelmed and oppressed and worthless and should be merciful to them. Let them feel encouraged today. Be reminded of how much you love them and gifted them and care for them. You are kind and gracious. We love you. It's for your beautiful name. Amen.